Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Buongiorno. Bonjour. I don't know how to say good morning in the Dene language. But my first story comes from northern Canada, where um, this is a native language. And these are um, called barren ground caribou. And they migrate across the tundra in the summertime. These herds once numbered in the hundreds of thousands and have declined dramatically, in many cases, by 90%. In the boreal forest, caribou remain year-round. And the Dene people have lived and hunted the caribou for thousands of years. They have a word for this specific kind of caribou, which they describe as darker colored, larger and heavier, and much more skittish of people. They have a different word for the barren ground caribou, um, which describes the caribou that migrate in this way. All caribou are actually the same species. In Europe, they call them reindeer. Um, so these car all the caribou in the world can mate with each other and interbreed, but they have specific behaviors. They look different, and they've adapted to specific habitats. The IUCN Red List notes that the subspecies designation for caribou is based on an outdated taxonomy. Scientists cataloged these subspecies with very few samplings. More recently, they would swoop down in helicopters and put a, a tag on a reindeer and later figure out um, where that reindeer or caribou went. And this is turned into situations where you can see on the slide that you know, on the left side, we have different Latin names for different kinds of caribou. And on the right side, we just have the general term for different kinds of caribou. And this is really problematic, because in conservation, they need to have what they call um, conservation units or evolutionary significant units. It doesn't help us to preserve some habitat for some caribou that doesn't actually live there. Well, it turns out um, that the Dene people have words for the different type of caribou that they have been hunting and relying upon for millennia. And scientists are now collaborating with indigenous people to learn from them about their knowledge of the local ecosystem, which is embedded in their language and their oral traditions. There's a Dene concept called Shigat, let me see if I can get this right, Shigagotsenete which is, means learning together. And they use this word to describe how the elders are collaborating with scientists on conservation that will help the caribou thrive again. And part of that is also including the youth, because it's important to have the youth learn the knowledge from both the elders and the scientists so they can bring it to future generations. So Jane Polfus is a scientist who um, studied the caribou in collaboration with the Dene people. And she actually tracked genetic differences and proved that these words actually described um, caribou that were significantly different from their um, genetic types. And um, particularly interesting is um, they had found a genetic difference that they couldn't explain. Or they didn't have, um, they didn't really understand where it came from. And from a, one of the stories from the elders, they tracked how this particular group of caribou had migrated to a different location and become isolated um, from a genetic perspective. In researching the caribou last weekend, I found this um, cave painting from 30,000 years ago. I studied art in college, along with computer science, and um, I always thought that cave paintings were like art, you know, sit around the campfire and look at paintings. Um, but upon reflection, 
uh, perhaps these were used as teaching techniques. And, and I found an interesting contrast to Polfus's research, where she documented how the elders taught the children about the different types of caribou, and then the children used art to really internalize these differences, which can help them learn traditional hunting techniques. So I really believe that language is the way that the past <coughs> communicates with the future. We use these words, like I feel that English, you know, and a couple of other languages are kind of mine. They're my words, they express my thoughts. But they're handed down from prior generations. They give me these words, and some words fall out of favor, and we stop using them. And sometimes we invent new words. And those new words and a new way of saying things is, is a kind of wisdom that we, we pass on to the future. And I think this is interesting when, for human spoken language, but it's particularly important when applied to programming languages. So I'll give you a little brief tour based on my vocabulary of programming languages. When I was um, uh, a teenager, I learned um, BASIC and Pascal, which are generally categorized as procedural languages. So as you all know, these uh, procedures are sequences of actions where computer programmers instruct the computer about you know, what it should do. For most of my career, I have done object-oriented programming. I first learned it in college with C++, and my first commercial software was written in C, um, but we use these patterns to associate functions with data to organize our code and have simpler architectures. And um, for years, I wrote graphic software for desktop applications and then for um, web browser plugins. You know, and then the um, early part, uh, at the early part of this century, <laughs> <laughs> I moved to JavaScript, um, where I worked on an object-oriented framework for doing graphical user interfaces on the web. And um, we had a vocabulary of views and layouts and words to describe animation to build up what we called the cinematic user experience. I later learned Objective-C and Ruby, which had a different heritage of object-oriented programming from Smalltalk where um, instead objects receive messages, but they retain this core property of keeping your data grouped with your code. A few years ago, as my work moved more to the server side, I became more and more interested in functional programming. I feel like this is some, a language I am not yet fluent in. I've read about it and experimented it a bit, but I can't yet think in this language, and I continue to be intrigued about what new powers would I have if I was really native in it? And um, so in preparing for this talk, I had the opportunity to spend some time talking to Dave Thomas, who wrote one of the first Erlang books. And I asked him to define, in his words, the difference between functional programming and object-oriented programming. And he had this nice, clear description that functional programming focuses on transformation of state, whereas object-oriented programming focuses on encapsulation of state. And um, it was interesting, because I, I reflected to him that, well, I think that, that graphical user interfaces are a perfect fit for object-oriented programming. Um, Don Norman talks about paper being an extension of our intellect, because it, it, like, we can, it sort of extends our memory space, right? We can have paper in front of us and keep other things in our brain. And I've always thought about graphical user interfaces that way. It kind of it's this state, right, that reflects back to us what we've done and what our new opportunities are. And it expands this shared memory with our brains. Like, what, is what, like what could be a more natural fit to object-oriented programming? And um, Dave said, well, functional programming is a much better fit. Um, actually, the, uh, if you think about how graphical user interfaces are constructed, there's, it's event-based programming, and every event triggers a transformation of state. And I wanted to argue with him. Um, because um, it's sort of related to this, this caribou story. Because I'd read, the, I, I showed you about the three types of caribou, but the Dene language has a, a fourth word for caribou 
that scientists haven't found any um, evidence of in the genetic material. And this article said that the Dene people believed that there was a fourth type of caribou. Now, I'd probably characterize that as a fact. If there were tens of thousands of years or millennia that people were <laughs> hunting a specific type of caribou, like maybe that caribou is extinct now, but that's probably not a mythical belief. But I found myself reflecting on object-oriented programming and thinking, that's an interesting belief Dave has. I've been doing object-oriented programming for 25 years, and I think I know better. So why I tell this story is there's this reality we all share. And we interpret that reality through our perceptions that our beliefs, and it's very easy to think that our beliefs are facts. And it's very easy to think that somebody else's facts are beliefs. So in thinking about this conference and this community, I've been thinking about what's this land where Erlang is the indigenous language? And what does it mean to have an elixir tribe descending upon this land, or maybe emerging from it? <laughs> Programming in a new language transforms our default path. It influences the kind of solutions we create. It's like living in a place with a different value of G. This different gravity makes some things much easier and other things much harder. I love it when language creators describe their worldview independent from the language. And I really valued reading um, the Erlang worldview as described by Joe Armstrong. And it shifted my thinking about putting it in this category of functional languages to putting in this category of something entirely different. And that was um, underscored by something I read by Jose Vallum, where he um, said in an interview that he has a very personal definition of functional programming, that it's about making the complex part of your system explicit. As an example, he talks about mutable state as data that changes over time, and that time is a source of complexity because it adds a bunch of moving parts to our system, and we end up having different pieces of data changing at different rates. So therefore, we don't want mutable state to be a primitive, but instead an abstraction that we use when we need it, making ourselves conscious of it, so that we can reason about that complexity in a different way. And the most imp interesting part, he says, is that functional programming is associated with concurrency, but not by design. It just happens that by making the complex part of our system explicit, solving more complex issues like concurrency actually become much simpler. So these languages allow us to express some things very simply, and other things require a bit more work to express. And it reminded me of um, Benjamin Worf's studies of the Hopi language, which is a Native American language, which is inaccurately described in popular media um, as, or the Hopi people are described as having no concept of time because their language has a very different way of describing time in their verb tenses. But that's like saying that functional programmers have no concept of state because you don't have it as a primitive. Um, but what's interesting, I think, about this is that the, um, they have three verb tenses, or three that Benjamin Worf describes. Um, they have the same tense that they use for past and present, that there are certain things that are happening right now or you just witnessed happening that are facts, that are part of our reality. Because they have happened, they are part of our reality because they are happening. They are part of our reality. Whereas the future tense, I will run, it uses the same tense that we use 
the subjective, I might run uh, if I'm going to run, if I were to run, because really the future is completely uncertain and who knows what's going to happen anyhow. And then they have another tense, which is like I run on the track team, where that's really a property of the noun, you know, that, that uh, I'm not really actively doing that. It just describes how I relate to the tr track team. And so I don't know if anybody's actually done further study on this, but uh, Worf believed that um, people who were native in Hopi would um, have an easier time understanding Einstein's theories of relativity than those of us who think about time flowing in discrete, discrete units like traveling a distance. So I think different words, different ways we construct language let us reason differently about the world. So in preparation for this talk, I was searching for a word which um, there's, there's many, many languages, in fact, I think it's probably every language, where there's a word in another language which takes many, many words to describe in a different language. But nonetheless, these human experiences are still reality. So um, I looked up, um, there's a fabulous book called The Book of Human Emotion by Tiffany Watt Smith that catalogs um, a lot of different human emotions, mostly in English, I assume that's her native tongue, but also in different languages where we don't have words in English. And um, one of those that I thought was suitable for this talk um, is, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, man Manarat. Um, so it, it's a word for um, a desire or a wish. And so this um, Hindu phrase is uh, used in school to motivate school children. And, it, and directly translated, it means, to date, nobody's ardent wish has been fulfilled without effort. So ardent wish is, um, it doesn't really mean a lot in English. It could mean, um, I have an ardent wish for a Porsche or for chocolate ice cream. But that would not be a good use of the term in Hindi. In, instead, it means, like the best word that I could come up with after reading a few descriptions of it was a calling. And um, I consulted with a Sanskrit scholar who my brother introduced me to, who as it turns out was a programmer for 33 years before um, she uh, became a Sanskrit scholar. And um, she said it's, it speaks to why you are put here on this earth. That as humans, we're all searching for that thing. Why are we here? And uh, my friend Vidya said that calling is a, it's a fair way to describe it, but it doesn't capture the yearning for that thing once you realize you've, you might have found it. And it seemed appropriate to me today because I, I, I think to myself, why am I here, like in this room, with all you people who know so much more about this, this land than I do. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But the, the key thing that I'm trying to describe is about how languages capture patterns of thought and the, this ability of language to express patterns seems so much more true of programming languages. So um, I had an opportunity to hang out with Jim Larson, who works on a neighboring team at Google, and um, learned a little bit more about Erlang in the last couple of weeks. And he wrote an ACM paper, which has this um, snippet of Erlang. And um, one of the things that he said is that you know, this, this probably would be pages of code in another languages, language. He underscored how false tolerance is encoded in the language of Erlang. And I've always heard um, from people, maybe people who, who didn't climb the learning curve all the way, that Erlang was hard to learn. And um, some people <laughs> accuse that of its syntax, which is unfamiliar to a lot of people who learned programming in the last five or 10 years. Um, 
But I think that one of the reasons it's hard to learn is because the concepts are so different. But those concepts are very powerful. And I think that's what gives people who become native in Erlang such a love of this language. Jim goes, went on to tell me that Erlang tries to embody a belief that a program is a dynamic living thing. That um, it's built of active processes that interact with each other, with the programmer and with the environment, and it can heal itself when it breaks. It can spread across multiple hosts and survive multiple crashes. So last little note on this language, and I want to share a story about why I, how I stumbled across over it and how it took me a little while to be able to look at the program and, and understand it. And um, it actually speaks to why I think that it's important to teach people to not be afraid to teach new programmers a hard language. Because I think what's hard about it is that you learned a different programming language first. So this was very hard for me to read because I come from a different world. And so I immediately think the thing on the right side of the, of the arrow is the function. And I can't help, when I first started reading these, this code, to just parse this. This is two functions that weirdly have the same name. <laughs> and it took me a lot of reading before suddenly, and I've, I've, this has been my experience with, with human spoken language, suddenly you stop translating in your head. Suddenly, you start thinking in the language. Suddenly, the concepts collapse. And suddenly, I can read this, and then it just seems like a logical way to construct an expression and to say something that means something. So, um, so this, after I became just a little, gained a tiny bit of fluency in reading Erlang, Suddenly, this JavaScript code looks baroque. <laughs> <laughs> so, and for completeness, I think um, the Elixir equivalent has some of the analogous challenges. It, it, it's a little, it was a little easier for me to read at first because it has some Rubyisms, but I think the what it expresses is more Erlang than Ruby. David Harrison, one of my favorite linguists, yes, I have favorite linguists, <laughs> notes that as we live in this digital age, we like to imagine, we have this kind of fantasy that any information that is useful is available to us somewhere in writing, in some book or library or database. It can be Googled. But that's not true. I'm going to shift now and talk about community. Because there is a wisdom in this community that is not yet effect effectively articulated for the world. And I look forward to all of you sharing more and more with the world the things that you know within this community that I think the world needs to know. But I'll share something from my own experience. This is a photo from the first Railsbridge workshop, which happened in 2009. We started with a simple concept, which has grown into a movement. The idea was to teach a new framework and language to both expert programmers and newcomers in a one-day workshop. We iterated on this format and found that there were key few ingredients that made it work. One was to have a diverse te teaching team. It's important that your students see themselves in the experts. Um, and it's an important way to teach each other that there are experts who all look differently. We offered childcare. We didn't want there to be any barriers to someone showing up. Food is a great equalizer and a great networking opportunity 
for people to talk to each other and share stories in an informal setting. We would always have an install fest the night before because sometimes it takes hours to install the things to make your programs work. And from my perspective, that is like the worst part of programming. Other people like that stuff, but um, with all of that out of the way, we have a day of coding. Then we have reserved this day for people to experience, to have no limits, on, and all the support in exploring a new language and a new framework. The mission of this group, which is now called Bridge Foundry, which includes eight different bridges, um, which are languages and frameworks that are, are taught by all, volunteers all over the world, is that we empower people with technology through teaching and facilitating access, enlarging the community of people who give back and teach others. And I think this is an important description of what we do and our call to action. But over the last few years, I felt like this didn't, like there's something going on here that was not well articulated. I kept hearing from people, like random women would come up to me and say, Rails Bridge changed my life. I'd read blog posts and tweets. Going to this workshop changed my life. It created this mysticism that people are, think that we have like a fully fledged program over months or years that are like transforming people's lives, but really it's just this one day workshop. What's going on? And I thought about like, what's this magical thing we do? I, I have some ideas, but I think if I asked a dozen different volunteers, what are the top three things that make this magic happen? I get 24 answers, and they'd all be probably right, and I don't know how I would rank them. One of the stories that gave me a bit of a clue is I kept hearing these little anecdotes from somebody who worked at a company where she would have uh, colleagues who had volunteered at workshops, and it would be like, well, I was here and this thing happened and it was a little weird and then this dude stepped up and he said the thing and oh my god I could go back to work and that was awesome. And what I saw was the workshops were having a transformational effect on the people who were volunteering to teach. That they were in fact learning some other skills that they were bringing back into the workplace. So. A small group of us got together a few years ago with a, a researcher, Julie Raymold, from, um, whose day job is working at SRI and studying educational processes and how they work. And we had, you know, we met like once a month or every few weeks for four or five months to talk about like a research project where we could like really surface what are the things that really work. And um, I just felt like it was all talk and we weren't getting anywhere. And then finally I asked Julie, I'm like, okay. So we've talked a lot. Like, what's our hypothesis? If we were going to ask somebody for a grant, what do we think we're, what, what do we learn here? I don't feel like these, you know, I don't know. Have, have these conversations taught, like, been meaningful to you? And she said, yes, I've done a lot, including to listening to you. I've done a lot of research, looked at your online presence, and she attended a workshop. And she said, I don't think you know what it is that you're teaching. She said that what you do in your workshops is you kind of inflate this culture. You are this community of practice and you teach your workshops like you make software. There's this collaborative process that you talk about that you do in your jobs that you love that makes it meaningful to you, that makes you productive, and that's what you're sharing. You are teaching your workshops like you do coding, and therefore you are sharing with people who don't have that work experience what it's really like to be a software engineer. And I thought, whoa. Like, yeah, I think that is what we do. Because 
you know, I read TechCrunch and the newspaper, and I hear about what a horrible place it is to work in this industry. And, you know, there's truth there. But there's this other truth that is not being spoken of, which is that it's awesome to work in this industry, and it's fun, and there are great environments out there where people treat each other with respect. And we need to make more of that, and we need to show newcomers that that's what they're looking for. And um, so this collaborative teaching, I think, is the thing. And we, we've sort of identified in the last year that, that what we're doing really, it sounds kind of bold, but that we're transforming tech culture. This thing that we do in the workshops is actually spreading beyond the workshops themselves. We're generating teachers, leaders, mentors. We're helping these people who are doing this anyhow to find each other and to build community. We are empowering the underserved, but they are helping us achieve this greater mission even more than we're providing skills and knowledge. I never expected that this soft and fluffy community stuff would be so deeply rewarding and intellectually challenging. Last year, I volunteered, although I mostly learned, at uh, the first Elixir Bridge conference. Anna Nysbridge is in the audience. Where are you? Here. Oh, back there. Yay, Anna. <laughs> and she's speaking today or tomorrow. Um, so Elixir Bridge is the same kind of format, the same type of workshop around Elixir and the tools and processes um, that come from the Erlang ecosystem. And I want to invite anybody who has an interest in this type of community building to send email to info at elixirbridge.org. Tell them what, what resources or skills you think you can share and what you want to learn. And I'm super excited to build that community and be part of that community together. This is a place where we found that students become teachers and teachers become mentors and we all learn together. So I wanna go back to um, this word. Why am I here? I felt called. I felt a certain urgency to show up, you know, like I, I kind of, like I have a job, and I, I, I just started at Google less than a year ago. I'm working on some deadlines. I'm, I'm working, getting ready for a talk at Google I.O. I, I have all sorts of things going on. I'm about to go to Warsaw next week. Like, you know, i got stuff going on. But Francesco reached out to me and said, um, you know, would you be willing to keynote this conference? And my immediate response was, yes. Wait, why? <laughs> so I felt this urgency to come and show up and speak with you today, but I think that like overstates my role. Even though I feel like I have something to share with you all, I think that maybe I'm here because I need to learn something from you. Perhaps I need new words, new vocabulary. Maybe I need a new language to express that thing that is the reason I've been put here on this earth. So I want to close with Chicago Tsenete, the word from the Dene language. We are here, not only on this earth, but for these two days to learn together. In the spirit of Chicago Tsenete, to learn from each other about Erlang, Elixir, OTP, and learn new words, new primitives, maybe invent some. There are people who came to this conference because they have a deep understanding of different domains, who are solving diverse problems, and have some insights that these languages, that this community can provide solutions. It's easy to be humbled by the stark 
and terrifying challenges that face our society today. It's easy to feel small and powerless. Yet each of us reflects now and then on why we're here in this world. What is the unique experience, the knowledge and skills that we can bring? And when we find it, we can transform our one small life into something just a little bit bigger and help to create the future together. Thank you. That's a great question. Our educational system was formed to support the industrial economy. I think most people know this, that what we're doing in our school system today doesn't actually um, serve our children, our young people. It's um, preparing them for a world that no longer exists. We cannot be cogs in a machine and survive in this world. And that transformation is hard. There's all sorts of things that are stuck. In fact, I, um, three years ago, I, was, I went to help our federal government with um, the, uh, the technology transformation that, um, uh, that Obama really instigated. Um, and I worked under Tard Park, first as a Presidential Innovation Fellow and then as a um, at 18F, um, which is a little consulting group inside the US government. And I was, I, I, I wrote about it on my blog that I think that like, if we could somehow get open source into the public schools, that that could be transformative, that could be unsticking. Our textbooks should be open source. We have the capability. Here in California, if we could get it together and require that textbook textbooks be open source, that would change the nation. We are the biggest school system in the nation. What I learned after going to the federal government, I did not do my research well enough. The federal government actually has very little to do with education, as it turns out. <laughs> um, I, w I was at the Smithsonian, so I, I did learn a lot about awesome things, and I think it had some influence there. Um, but I think that in small ways and big ways, we need to make this transformation happen. There are policy ways, I think, by requiring open. What happened in Brazil with open source is phenomenal. It reinvigorated the economy. If anybody is inspired or know people who know how to make policy, <laughs> pass laws, like, I think that's some place where a small change could make a huge difference. And these things are possible. The other thing is by getting involved. I volunteered at my kid's school. Just, I showed up. Um, you know, every morning in kindergarten for an hour. I still got in to work before most of my fellow engineers. <laughs> <laughs> that, and you can do that even if you don't have kids. It's, um, it's phenomenal how the presence of a grown-up transforms kids' lives. Kids need the grown-ups in our community. Kids need to be connected to the new world. And the teachers were trained. The teachers can't, they can facilitate how to teach, but they need people, experts coming from industry to help them understand how to bring this new technology to kids. So there's a great um, organization called the Computer Science Teachers Association, which has great resources if you're doing any volunteering with kids, teaching, programming. Um, but I think that in every different way, each of us has to do something to move the needle just a little bit. Um, and I think 
these things seem slow moving, but we have to keep moving that way, and then all of a sudden there's a tipping point. Another question? Okay, another one goes for Sarah. Thank you for inspiring. 